Mortimer, Episode 20. Thank you for tuning in to Mortimer, a book written by M.W. Cedars and narrated by Michael Drew. The theme music was written and performed by Danny Torgerson. Mortimer is an entire novel that you may decide to read in print or digital form. Yet each episode of this audio podcast is broken up into a serial of sorts for your enjoyment. We hope you enjoy this duty-free audio presentation of Mortimer. Another episode of this disturbing radio drama. If I didn't know any better, I would say the narrator wants my enemies to prevail. I say nay. Truth and justice shall triumph. The next morning, Mrs. Dixon came into the kitchen, a dejected expression on her face. Billy and Mrs. Peabody were chopping vegetables at the center island. Oh, dear, not another rejection. Mrs. Peabody looked up as Mrs. Dixon flopped into a chair. It seems that Miss Lakesmith has been enrolled in the Westlake School for Girls. For girls? Mrs. Peabody was genuinely puzzled. That's three cows in a row for Linda. Mrs. Dixon sighed aloud. Ignoring Millie's burst of laughter, Mrs. Lakesmith said that her husband had determined that Milfred's talents would be better fostered in California. Well, do do you suspect that it had anything to do with her dancing on the table? wondered Millie between giggles. Hush your tongue! But she did dance. We must not speak of anything that happened at the party. Who else have you called, dear? Mrs. Peabody redirected. I called Milfred Lake's Miss Parents just now, of course. Before that, I spoke with Mr. Bartholomew, who is Hilda's father. Oh, what did he say? Felinda was hopeful. He said that we would need to look over our accounting before scheduling a visit. Well, that's not difficult. Can we not call the barrister? While I want to marry Martimer off, I do not want to inflict him with a money-hungry father-in-law. But you said... I know what I said. Mrs. Dixon interrupted Millie. She knew what the girl was going to say. She was going to remind everyone how Mrs. Dixon had planned the entire evening for the purpose of attracting a wealthy wife for Mortimer. But now that was all happening, Mrs. Dixon couldn't help but feel a little guilty. Whatever happened to marrying for love? Mrs. Dixon sighed. Whom else did you speak to, dear? Mrs. Peabody urged. Miss Bloom. Was she wearing a pale blue dress? Brown curls? Billy dropped a load of cut ochre into a bowl. Yes. Why? I told her and two other girls that Mortimer saved the rich captain of the SS Angelica. Mrs. Peabody was surprised. Did he? It's not a real story, clarified Mrs. Dixon. She was rather interested in Mortimer, said her father. However, I was told just this morning she received a call from a suitor they had lost hope in long ago. Apparently an agreement for marriage was made just prior to me contacting them. Oh, bad timing, Millie was sympathetic. The return of lost love is quite romantic, though, Mrs. Peabody added carrots to a boiling pot of water. Romantic or not, I'm working my way through this list of names quite quickly. How many more do you have? Seven. Mrs. Dixon looked back at the clock on the wall. Where is Neville? I sent him to the shipyard over two hours ago. It doesn't take that long to get to town and back. I do hope that boy is there today with a list of those who boarded the safari. I'm dreadfully worried about Mortimer. Even dark boys need a day off. I'm sure he's on that ship. Where else would he be? He's on the Atlantic Ocean as we speak, Neville proclaimed, coming into the kitchen. Oh, we were just talking about you, Millie jumped up excitedly. So Mortimer's going to Africa. Mrs. Peabody dropped her stirring spoon and was at Neville's side. She grasped the sleeve of his tweed jacket desperately. Tell me, Neville, is he safe? I spoke to the boy myself. Neville tried to slip out of her grasp. Seems as though he took the list home with him when he got off work last Saturday. As Neville successfully extracted himself from Mrs. Peabody's grip, he straightened his coat. 
I was quite in trouble with the boss, I'd say. The Longhorns may be a wealthy shipping line, but their organisational structure leaves much to be desired. He took his top hat off and tossed it onto the counter. Then he removed his scarf. Neville, tell me what the boy said, Mrs Dixon demanded. He said that he saw, and I quote, a genteel young man board the ship to Africa early that morning. That's wonderful, Mrs Peabody clapped her hands together. But did he confirm the name of that young man who boarded the ship? No, Elizabeth, he didn't. But he did say that the chap was wearing a captain's hat. It was, Mortimer, Mrs Peabody proclaimed with relief. There was one strange thing, though. Mrs Dixon felt her heart skip a beat. Strange? Neville looked from Mrs Dixon to Mrs Peabody. Mortimer was not alone. What? Millie was all ears. Who was with him? The boy didn't have the list of names any more. He declared that the boss took them and that the boss was in an all-day meeting. Seeing the disappointed looks around him, Neville forced himself to sound encouraging. But he said the other person was a chap in a brown cloak. Well, who do you suppose Martin Mum was with? Mrs Dixon asked. Neville lifted his right shoulder. I was told to find out if Mortimer boarded the ship to Africa, which I have confirmed. Do you think it was Lily Lou with him? Millie's grin was mischievous. Where would you come up with such a silly notion? Mrs Dixon shot back. Lily Lou is a good girl, and if she wanted to board one of her father's own ships, she would not need to wear a cloak. Mrs Dixon felt more confident, having declared her position aloud. But what if she didn't want to be seen? countered Millie. The boy indicated to Neville that it was a male that he saw with Mortimer. Maybe it was a girl dressed as a man. Three surprised heads swivelled toward Mrs Peabody. What? It's not impossible. John's flat was exactly as he'd left it several days before. He took his tie off and tossed it onto the Davenport to the right of the door. Crossing the generously sized living area, he approached the glass doors that led out to the veranda and opened them, allowing a crisp breeze to blow into the otherwise stagnant room. He trudged away, leaving the doors ajar. It was the crack of dawn, and he was exhausted. Opening the icebox, John stared stupidly at the contents. His brain was catatonic. The sound of knocking startled him violently. John cursed. <sighs> Who could that be? Muttering obscenities, John closed the door of the icebox and crossed the living room. He opened the front door and glared at the man facing him. Anderson's smile was manic and irritating to John's foggy cognitive state. What the hell are you grinning for? Anderson handed John a thermos of black coffee. Welcome home. I'm not going to drink this. I'm going to bed. John flopped down on the sofa. Sorry, no can do. Anderson stood in the doorway while John closed his eyes. Go away. I'm afraid I can't do that, buddy. John was becoming increasingly irritated. Anderson was one of his best friends. However, at this moment, John had the mind to break his jaw. Instead, he kicked off his shoes one by one. What do you want? You're needed in the office. I just got off a train from South Carolina. I'm not going to the office. Wolfenstein needs to see you. Wolfenstein can wait until tomorrow. Anderson kicked John in the foot. He sounded serious. And you know how his nostrils flare when he's up in arms about something. His nostrils flare because he's an ogre. John rested his head back on the couch and tried to will Anderson to disappear. Well, ogre or not, both of his nostrils were dilated when he told me to get you. That got John's attention. He peeped open one eye. Both? Yeah. Anderson held the coffee out again. Take this. I think you're going to need it. I'd hardly call this a meal, Mortimer declared with condescension. Oh, this ship had better fix than that other one sailing into Africa. Oh, her. An assault on the body from repulsive nosh such as this shall truly render my digestion devastated. I be thinking it's mighty fine. Sid took a contented bite from the plate of grub in his hand. Mortimer shrugged and ate as well. While the meal was no custard, no mutton, and no sauerkraut, there was sausage. Upon learning that sausage had been purchased from some lowly factory in New York City, Mortimer had originally, and quite rightfully, attempted to coerce his shipmates into having a heated demonstration on the deck of the ship. However, 
That had landed him locked below deck with a mountain of chores and a hungry belly. Since then, he'd learned not to cause dissent among the crew about the origins of the galley menu. That didn't mean, however, that he wasn't allowed to complain a little. So are ye ever going to tell us your real name, eh? Cowlick shoveled a massive spoonful of gruel into his mouth. Her mistress is my object of attention. She is the true Aphrodite, the true Mona Lisa, the immaculate rose. Kilgrew snorted and took another bite. So, it's a lady you're funny for, Sid leaned forward. Tell me, lad, is she a sultry woman? Mortimer's massive pink tongue shot out so that he could lick the grease from his plate. That is disgusting. Kilgrew recoiled, watching in horror, as the misanthrope captain slurped and sucked the fat and oil from his plate. He can eat, that he can, another observed as he approached. He put his hand on Kilgrew's shoulder. Captain needs a word with ye. Fine, it'll take me away from this disgusting scene. Kilgrew stood up. He tossed his plate at Mortimer. My linen! Mortimer spat grease as he protested in vain the mess that Kilgrew's plate had made on his outfit. Watch your mouth or your linens will be the least of your concerns. Kilgrew shot back. After he left, the three men ate together silently. The day had been a fine one, with blue skies and smooth waters. The ship groaned happily as they sailed on towards Cuba. A calm day as it was, Cowlick finally broke the silence. Oh, storms in the air, Sid's face darkened with concern. Her mistress shan't capitulate, no matter the fury Poseidon may bring. Are you sure? Ignoring Mortimer, Cowlick glanced at Sid with worry. They rang the sound of a bell above. Cowlick looked up at the ceiling. Aye, his voice was gruff. So there be. I told ye, Sid pushed up from the table. He peered over at Mortimer. Have ye got your sea legs yet? My life is at sea. Well, would have bet me life that you'd never been aboard a ship in all your life, <laughs> two days ago at least. The ship groaned and the bell rang again. Footsteps thundered down the stairs and a sailor appeared. Sid, Kowlick, and you. He pointed at Mortimer. You're all needed on deck. How bad is it? Sid was halfway to the stairs. She's gonna be a big un! The man called over the wind. He better say your prayers, or this time tomorrow we'll all be in Davy Jones's locker. Well, Mrs. Jones comes in every Tuesday for a refill on her vinegar, a, a case of cola, and for the weekly issue of Life magazine. George collapsed cardboard boxes as he spoke. Hand me that blade there, will you? Uh, this one's getting dull. Sure. Orange tried to appear casual as he watched George work. He was wearing plain clothes today, since it was common knowledge that he'd been fired from the force. All of his work would be done without anyone suspecting that they were being interviewed for official police matters. Orange was enjoying functioning in a spy-like role. For starters, there was less pressure since no one expected anything of him. Also, because people were a whole lot more willing to talk to you about personal matters when you weren't wearing a police uniform. She missed last week, though. She called in and asked me to set her goods aside so that she could get a double batch this week. She's due tomorrow, I suppose. George used the new blade to cut through another box. I heard her son is in jail. Orange leaned casually against the support beam in the back of George's store. Think that has anything to do with her not coming in? Oh, I suspect so. Nice boy, too. George collapsed the box and tossed it into a pile. It's a shame, really. Have you heard anything about him getting into any other trouble? Orange resisted the urge to take his notepad out of his back pocket. He knew that doing so would look a little too obvious. Nothing beyond the normal. You, you know how young men can be. George shot a glance at Orange. Well, maybe you don't. George reached for another box. Good boy like you. Mm. Such a shame that you lost your job at the station. Orange sighed. While most of the town looked at him in pity, it was rather embarrassing to have lost his job. Instead of being viewed with respect, he was now seen as a boy who was too nice to make it in the force. You're just too soft, Peter. Don't worry, though. That quality will make you a fine husband to Emily. Thanks, George. Orange cleared his throat. What about ladies? You looking for another? 
George shot Orange a disapproving look. No, no, not me. I, I mean Morris. Orange shook his head violently. Boy, had that backfired. The last thing he needed was a rumour being spread that he was on the prowl for a prostitute. Emily would kill him. Of course, she'd know it wasn't true because Orange was absolutely dedicated to her, but it would embarrass her and bring her shame. That was the last thing Orange wanted to happen. Why are you so interested in Morris? George took a break from collapsing boxes and stood up to stretch his lower back. It's the most exciting thing that's happened in Georgetown as of late. Orange shrugged. It's not every day that someone's locked up for something besides shoplifting and being a bit too rowdy in this town. Uh, I suppose that's true. George took a swig from a brown bottle of cola. I can't tell you that you're wrong about that one. The front doorbells chimed. If you'll excuse me now, I have a customer. Sure. Orange shoved his hands into his pockets and pretended to shop as George made his way to the front of the store. Mrs. Albright, oh, it's a pleasure to see you. Upon hearing her name, Orange ducked behind an aisle. Mrs. Albright was the last person he wanted to see. She was a notorious busybody, and he did not want her to go telling the town that he was hanging around people's stall. He didn't want her talking about him at all. Then an idea began to take hold. Mrs. Albright was a gossip. In fact, she was one of the most well-informed women in the South. If anyone knew anything about Sissy or Matilda Hornwasher, it would be her. He emerged from behind an aisle and swallowed down a lump of anxiety. Ah, oh, Mrs. Albright, he called out cheerfully. Pleasure to see you. The Centennial Shipping Line headquarters was in the heart of Manhattan in New York City. John took a drink from the steaming cup of Joe and followed Anderson up the busy street toward the Centennial Building. Anderson hadn't stopped talking since they'd gotten into the cab. She insists that she heard her list that price and is causing the entire family a load of grief. She refuses to submit and just order the damn thing. I don't know what all the fuss is about. They look basically the same to me. John hadn't been listening and didn't have a clue what Anderson was babbling about. Eh, sounds like a pain, he muttered. You're telling me. Anderson opened the glass door for John and followed him inside. The hue of the material isn't important in the long run. But for ladies, well, it can be a matter of life and death. Anderson lowered his voice as they entered the massive marble lobby that made up the first floor of the Centennial Building. Lucky you never had a sister. They can be a real nightmare. John decided it was time for a change of subject. It would probably be beneficial for him to know what sort of a stupid reason Wolfenstein had for dragging him into the office at the crack of dawn. In the past, it could have been something as trivial as a receipt gone missing or a form not signed. Knowing Herberger, it was likely that John was being dragged in all the way across town unnecessarily. Having a preview of what the old diarrhoea machine wanted would enable him to come up with a quick, witty and decisive retort so that he could more quickly get back to his flat and go to sleep. Do you have any idea what this meeting is supposed to be about? Anderson shook his head. Nope. Good morning, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Iscariot, one of the building secretaries said. Good morning, Matilda. Fetching sweater. Anderson was all charm. Good morning, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Iscariot. Another walked past. Anderson tipped his hat. Hello there, Louisa. Fine day. Why is it that every woman addresses you first? John hissed. It's because I'm better looking than you are. John grumbled beneath his breath as they entered the elevator. The bellman was wearing a red jacket and a pair of black slacks. A stupid hat was atop his mop of coal-coloured hair. Which floor? Twelve, Anderson answered. Same floor as it's been every other day for the past fifteen years, John wanted to say, but instead he bit his tongue and focused his attention on Anderson, who'd moved on to other matters. So, you haven't said a word about South Carolina? He grinned as the elevator ascended. How was the coming out party? The bellman shot the men a look. Absolutely ridiculous. John looked at the ceiling as the elevator moseyed up to the twelfth floor. <laughs> did Mrs. Dixon put him into a little party dress? Shockingly, no. But she did teach him to act like an absolute ignoramus. Did she? Saying, how do you do? Lifting his pinky. The wax, uh, 
Oh, I'm sure if there'd been a baby present, he would have kissed it. <laughs> like the Queen of England. Anderson was thoroughly amused. John nodded with regret. He was surprisingly convincing, though Mortimer has always had a knack for playing the part when it's beneficial for him to do so. Floor 12, announced the bellman. The door of the elevator opened. Thanks, chap. Anderson followed John toward the office. Was the whole family there? Don't start that. John stopped at his secretary's desk. Any messages? The secretary did not bother to look up. Three, the doctor called about your pills again. You do not have to announce my messages out loud. John snatched the stack of slips from her. I'm quite capable of reading them myself. You have a meeting with Mr... I know. John stormed into his office. Miss Peach met Anderson's smiling eyes. Well, isn't he in a delightful mood this morning? What time's this meeting with Wolfenstein? Um, eight o'clock, which is in ten minutes, Anderson interrupted. I'm on it. Thanks, Miss Peach leaned forward and watched as Anderson disappeared through the double wooden doors that led into John's office. John had planted himself on the sofa that was to the left of the massive desk that rested in the centre of the room by the windowed walls. You have ten minutes, John. Anderson closed the door behind him. Ah! Uh, John was lying flat on this leather sofa, his arm thrust over his eye and a cigarette burning in his other hand. What is it he wants this time? He didn't tell me. He tells you everything. Well, that may be close to the truth, Anderson shrugged. He sat in the chair opposite John, but he didn't tell me what this was about, just that I was supposed to bring you in. He swirled his thermos of coffee thoughtfully. Though I do got to say, John, this time I think it's serious. Why? Because of the nostril flares. John rolled his eyes beneath his arm. Be serious. Not just because of the nostril flares. Also due to him calling a private meeting without saying anything to the board. Pulling executive power. Mortimer has missed several meetings and it was your responsibility to get him here. Uh, you think this is about that idiot? John pushed himself up into a seated position and puffed at his cigarette. You know, you should really cut back on smoking. My doctor says it's good for me. Anderson furrowed his brow. I don't see how sucking back pounds of smoke is good for you. John took an extra deep drag and blew smoke directly toward Anderson. If Wolfenstein is pissed about Mortimer, why doesn't he just place a call to him? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. Well, I might as well head down there. John smashed his cigarette onto the green glass ashtray on the coffee table. Will you be around when I get out? I figured you might need a shoulder to cry on. <laughs> Funny. If I have anything to do with it, I'll come out of there, rich man. Rich! John straightened his suit coat. With Mortimer letting the board down yet again, and the contract needing an Iscariot in charge, it's only a matter of time. Seems to me the most likely reason for this meeting is that I'm to be promoted. Well, John, Anderson stood and clapped a hand on his friend's shoulder. For your sake, I hope you're right. The house was in a frenzy. Millie stood in the doorway, smelling salts in hand, as Mrs. Dixon and Mrs. Peabody tried to soothe the screeching Bobby Sue. Jeb stood awkwardly in the corner of the room. He's got to be here somewhere. While we've searched the groans and Jeb here has been out for hours, we have to call the police. No! Oh, Mrs. Dixon! Bobby Sue launched into a fresh shed of tears. We can't call the police. But why not? Cause they lock him up in a t in a tiny little cell and he'll <laughs> grow a beard and they'll, they'll cut off his beautiful red curls. Ah, I just can't stand it. They won't arrest him, Bobby Sue. They'll bring him back here. My friend Abner May. <laughs> Told me one time her husband got arrested by the Pope. He said that they beat him with a bat and they made him do all sorts of unholy things. Mrs. Dixon shot a look over at Mrs. Peabody. I assure you that will not happen. No, darling. I know the sergeant of the station in town. He's a very nice man. Mrs. Peabody added. You see, look, Christian. Bobby Sue sniffed. Mrs. Dixon patted Bobby Sue's hand. I'm sure he is. But, 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 but uh, uh, have you seen him at church? The bell rang, much to Mrs. Dixon's relief. 
I'll get the door for Linda, Millie, get Bobby Sue, whatever she wants. Mrs. Dixon wiped her hands on her apron and her heels clopped across the floor, the sound bouncing and echoing around the high ceiling rafters. Her thoughts were racing as she pulled the front door open. She narrowed her brow and looked around with confusion. Down here! Mrs. Dixon looked down at the stoop where a portly little red-headed boy stood carrying a massive stack of papers. Mrs. Dixon opened the door all the way and she linked her hands in front of her. Well, hello there. My name's Albert. Can I interest you in a ticket to the auction this weekend? It's May, dear, Mrs. Dixon corrected. Try again. The lad wrinkled his nose at the grammatical lesson on a weekend nonetheless. But a sale was a sale, and his pard promised him, if he made ten sales, that he'd get that toy airplane that he'd been eyeballing for the past three weeks. May I interest you in a ticket? No, came the reply. I'm afraid not. The boy was shocked. His jaw even dropped a little. But I said may. Seeing me does not guarantee you will get everything you want in life. It just makes you sound like a civilised human being. What is civilised? It means polite and well-mannered. Please buy a ticket, the boy pleaded. It's for the school. The school? Albert straightened his shoulders. For education. Mrs. Dixon crossed her arms and peered down her nose. Do you go to Georgetown or to St. Augustine? Uh, Georgetown Elementary. I I'm in fifth grade. Ah, uh, Mrs. Dixon nodded in understanding. That explains your lack of grammatical acumen. Uh, OK, Albert shifted on his feet, for his arms were growing heavy. Well, is there anyone else I can talk to? I'm afraid not. The boy's eyes widened as he spied something behind Mrs. Dixon. Who is that? Mrs. Dixon twisted to see what was behind her, and much to her horror she saw Mrs. Iscariot twirling like a ballerina on the staircase. Unfortunately, the morning after the party, the mistress of the house had gone back to her normal state of madness. Mrs. Iscariot spotted the child on the stoop and hurried down the last two steps of the staircase. Do you have a lion in your circus? The boy looked genuinely confused. No, Mrs. Iscariot, there is no circus. Mrs. Dixon tried to soothe the woman. She was wearing a long white nightgown and her hair was in disarray. She looked like one of the witches Albert had read about in books. There will be games and a bandstand next weekend, though, he offered hopefully. It'd be pretty neat to have a real live witch at the festival. And will there be apples? The boy nodded, enthusiasm building. Y yeah, we'll bob for apples. Then he lifted his heavy laden arms. Will you buy a ticket? Ooh! Absolutely not, the dark-skinned woman said, disappointing Albert. She turned to the woman who was hungrily grabbing at the stack of papers. How about we see if Mrs. Peabody has an apple in the kitchen? Apple picking! Mrs. Dixon turned back to the boy. If you will excuse me, the door closed behind her. The sky was black. Mortimer looked around him. The whip of the sea air rushed through his thick, unruly hair. Mortimer had been missing his captain's hat, but he particularly missed it now, for it offered him protection from the elements, reminded his compatriots of his rank, and could be used as camouflaged at a moment's notice. The storm came upon them quickly and savagely, with an explosion of a thunderbolt and a drenching wave from the sea. Soaking wet, Mortimer placed his hand atop his head to hold his massive mound of hair in place and silently berated himself for obeying his nanny and leaving his hat upstairs during the party. Sentries had abandoned their posts and were running about frantically, engaged in strange seafaring rituals that confused Mortimer. He watched them, taking note of how their uncoordinated movements were far inferior to the cast of heroes Mortimer was accustomed to on his bottleboat voyages. A lit by lantern light, Mortimer spied a man of obvious high station, shouting out directives into the increasing pandemonium. At the mast! Raise the foresail! Pull the lines! Due to the ferocious wind, the maiden flag flapped wildly from the stern. Mortimer's massive hand shot out, and he braced as her mistress tipped violently to the right. She tipped again, but this time to the left, flinging Mortimer against the other side of the doorframe he was braced against. My God! Mortimer yelped as he held on for dear life. 
perhaps it would be better to return beneath deck, Mortimer wondered aloud to the growing insanity before him. Contemplating this decision, Mortimer froze at a silhouetted figure barreling toward him through the blackness. Back away! Mortimer's shriek was lost in the wind as a stranger reached out and grabbed his shirt. A storm like this and we'll lose the canvas! All men must be at the ready! Help! Mortimer tried to wriggle free. The grip was fierce. She can hold it, but ye must begin to bail! Bail? The man released Mortimer and pulled a bucket off a nail that was along the wall behind him. Get ye to work! He disappeared into the darkness, while the storm assaulted the galleon with all its strength and power. This was nothing like what he'd ever imagined. Mortimer stood frozen in terror, with his bucket in hand. Despite the blackness, the wind, the tossing ship, and the wetness of the deck, the man moved across the poop deck with admirable skill. Mortimer watched as he made his way to the helm, taking over from another who had been holding the ship steady. He grabbed the wheel, twisted, and the ship responded. A wave approached, stretching ten, twenty, Mortimer judged to be at least thirty feet into the air. This was not how things were supposed to be. Nothing like Mortimer had assumed, plotted, or planned. He heard a voice of a comrade call above the storm. Look out! Grab a hold! called another. Mortimer hugged the doorframe and closed his eyes as the wave slammed into the ship, blackening the lanterns and leaving them in all darkness. Learn more at www.mortimerbook.com. Copyright 2022, M.W. Cedars. Written by M.W. Cedars, the author pseudonym, audiobook performance by Michael Drew. Neither this author nor affiliates, comrades, patriots, or associates are engaged in rendering professional or non-professional advice, services, recommendations, or any other suggestions of any kind to the individual reader. This book is purely fiction, and all opinions and all likenesses of characters, industries, cities, or associations with any place or anyone you know are purely coincidental. Thank you for subscribing to Mortimer, a book written by M.W. Cedars and narrated by Michael Drew. The theme music was written and performed by Danny Torgerson. Be sure to download the next episode.